So now, I hope you had a good rest because now the math is getting a little, it's going to get harder and harder and harder. All right. So um, here's the idea behind these factor analysis approaches. And this particular approach applied to, to gene expression was first done in a paper um, for a method called SVA, surrogate variable analysis. And it's, there's a package that does it. But now there's many more groups that are starting to adapt that idea uh, and coming up with their own approaches based on factor analysis. So I will cover factor analysis, PCA, and then explain how SV SVA as a specific solution to the, to the problem. But like I said, there's now more and more research being done on this. There's it's like five, I've seen at least five or six papers that that, are Im that implement the, the, what was originally published in the SVA paper in different, you know, using different approaches. Okay, so here, here's our, this is the same stuff we were doing before, right? Ah, get this out. And here you have something new. Right, so he, this is the sex or the covariate of interest. This is the measurement error. And now we have something new. And what that something new is, uh, they're going to be a, a set of, you, we could call them covariates in this matrix W that explain the groupings. So for example, in the case of, if, if it's just date, let's say, let's say there's a date effect, uh, a, a very strong year effect, and there's a day of the week effect, let's suppose. We don't know it, but let's suppose that's the case. Then we would have, this W would have two columns. Uh, it would have the, uh, they're actually rows, right? They go that way. They would have, one row would tell you the year, and the other one would tell you the day of the week. Okay, so now we have, it's, it's, that's kind of like combat, right? It's like combat. The only difference is, we actually don't know that. With combat, we know it and we put it in ourselves. Now we don't actually know it. That's, I'm telling you the truth as if, you know, as, as if we, were the, the, we, could, we, we were clairvoyant, but we're not. So we actually have, we want to estimate these Ws. We want to find out what they are using data. Sounds impossible, but it is. So, so what I'm saying is, if the real generating model is actually using year and day of the week. We don't know it, but we're going to find out, and we're going to fix it. So that's what, we, um, that's what we're going to do. So here's the, the, tr the general trick of, all the, of many of the approaches that are out there, is to somehow find a group of genes for which this thing is not there, for which this thing is zero. And so we have the mean level, that's fine. The mean level, we're going to kind of stop talking about it because it could always be subtracted out and we keep going. But the actual, the sex one, the sex, the sex factor that we want to estimate, that we want, we're interested in, we're going to assume that none, none, for a group of genes, this guy um, is zero and we're going to use that to try to get what this W is. So in this particular example, that subset of genes, the best one to use, would probably be this, this group where there is no sex effect, but there, but there is a batch effect, and it'll help us get what W is. So here, here's the idea. Right, so if we can find a group of genes for which the betas are zero, that this is a group of genes where the outcome of interest, which in this case is sex, is not an effect, it's zero. So for this group of genes, all that's left is the batch part. So the, these Ws. So in the example we're thinking of, we would have year, day of the week, maybe lab technician, who knows. But we, just, we, just, we don't really know what they are. But now we have this model and we say every gene has, has, a, has this column that describes the batch effects and then each gene, that batch effect has a different effect and that's absorbed into these parameters alpha. So this is, this is a, linear, it's a linear model, just like all the, the other ones we've seen, with the only exception, <laughs> the only difference, which is kind of a big difference, that we don't actually know 
what the covariates are. So to do that, to, to find out what those covariates are, we're going to use PCA. Principal Component Analysis. OK, so here, I'm going I'm to try to explain how Principal Component Analysis can get to these, to these unknown variables. So, so again, I just uh, to, to, to say it again, how hard, how hard this really is. We don't really know what these covariates are. We're going to try to find out what they are. So I'm going to use an example to explain PCA and how it gets to that. So I, I don't know. PCA is something that doesn't get explained very often. Everybody say, oh, just, you just find the things that explain the most variability. It's like magic, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to try to maybe explain it a little bit today. So I'm going to use a very simple example uh, of what this is, of how, how, um, how, how PCA can actually get to this. All right, so here's, here's the example. We um, know that there is a, we have n samples, and we know that there is a, that there is some hidden batch effect there that has half, no, not half, some of them, some of the samples are from one batch, and another group of the samples is from another batch. But we don't know what the batch is. We just know that the batch is there. We don't know who goes where. So suppose, suppose we, we, can order them, we can order them so that, just another assumption just to make it simple, we can order them so that they're, they're let's say it's, it's order in time, and we know that at some point in time, the reagents changed, and now we have another batch. But we don't know when it was. So now what we're, what we're after then is this N1. Right? So imagine you have 24, and somewhere in there, the, the reagent changed, and that's N1. We don't know. It could be 13, it could be 17, it could be 12. We don't know. So if we, if we, if we know what the N1 is, then we're going to have, if we multiply the Y by this <coughs> vector, Right, this, is a ba this is basically a vector of zeros and ones. Right, you have one, 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 negative, I'm sorry, of ones and negative ones. So you have one, 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 negative one, negative, negative one, and then we have this division to, to normalize it. So if we have that, look at what we have over there. We have the average of the first and one minus the average of the, of the others. Right? The first one is the average up to n1, and then the average of the others. So now think about this. How would you pick N1? What would you do? Let's say you can play around with, with, with 1, 2. You can try them all. Which one would you pick? Which N1 would you pick? Yes. You pick the one where the delta is the biggest, negative or positive. You see why? We pick it. We're going to take the one that makes them the most different because we know there's a batch there. So whatever that, wherever it is, that we, if we split it right at the batch, it's going to be as different as possible. If we, if we include some of the batch one and the batch two, then it gets attenuated. All right, so that's, that's how we would do that. So that's not that hard. We can do that. Now, imagine that it, it gets even better because we don't have just one gene. We have a bunch of genes. So we can actually pick the N1 that maximizes the explained variability. So you have this, you have one difference for each gene, so you square, this is the variance for one gene, and you add up all the variance as well. But you have to order all the variables from data. Yeah, this is just an illustration. Okay. You'll see now that there's, you don't have to do that, but this is for illustrative purposes. This is not, what, this is not how PCA actually works. I'm motivating it. Right, so you, you basically pick the N1 that maximizes the variability. Now, now, we're, now we're talking like the PCA, the, when people describe PCA like magic, right? You pick, you, it's a transformation that increments the variance. So this is a transformation. We're taking the Ys and we're transforming them by taking, putting a one in front of the ones that have batch one and a negative one, the ones that don't. So every gene gets the average on batch one, the average on batch two. That's a transformation. 
Okay, so now we're going to get to your question. So the, the thing is that you can generalize this. This is, a, this is a math mathematics you really start appreciating it because you, you actually can write it out like this is more general now. Now we're saying we're going to multiply each y by some number. Some number. It's not going to be minus 1 and 1 anymore. It's any number. There's only one little, there's one little um, constraint I'm going to put on. And it's that they have to add up, the v's have to add up to 1. That's the only constraint I'm going to have. So if you say that, if you, so it, it, it's, you see how it's similar to the previous one? In the previous one, we were, we were only doing 1's and minus 1's. Now we're just saying anything, any v, any, any, any number, as long as the vj's add up to 1. So this is, you can use mathematics to figure out what is the v that maximizes this. Right, so this is, if you look at this thing, in the previous example, the v's are either 1 or minus 1, and you pick the ones that made this really big. So there's, you can use ca like a calculus trick to do it in general and figure out what vector maximizes this variance. That's the first principal component. That's all it is. Actually, that's wrong up there. Mean zero variance one. I don't know why, why I wrote it that way. It's really that the, <laughs> the sum is one. I don't know why I wrote that. I was stuck on statistician mode. So what this also yeah. is the algorithm for like finding the largest eigenvector. Yeah, that's what it is. That's what PCA that's is. Yeah. No, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. You're just saying it in German. It's my Dutch accent. Eigen. <laughs> <laughs> See, there you go. OK, so that's, that's, what that, that's what the first principal component is. It's the linear combination of the y's that maximizes the variance. And it, it's, 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 you're just kind of playing around with them until you get that, in, in, the, in the way I think about it, is until you get the right separation. So you get one group over here, another group over here, and they're very different. So the June, the June and the October genes, that we, we would pick that as the first one because there's a lot of genes that in October were high and in June they were small. So they would, that, that separation, that V, would coincide with, with the year, with the month. It just happens. It's not that we knew, it's just that it happens. So now, that's the first principal component. The other ones, it's the same thing. You subtract out this, what you, what you estimated here, you take it out, and now you, you do it again. With the, with the rest. And you get the next one, and you take it out, you get the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one, until you run out of variability. And that's how you get, the, this, the, it's called the eigen decomposition, the principal component decomposition, the singular value composition. It has all these names. But this is basically what you're doing. And so when I write this, this linear algebra thing, all this is is just saying that. It's just you're multiplying each y by some number, and the way to make it even simpler is to say, is it going to be a 1? Is it going to be in this group, or is it going to be in that other group? 1 or minus 1. It's never really 1 or minus 1, but it's, sometimes it's, it's that simple. Just kind of separates them into two groups. Yeah? Yeah, good question. Yeah, let's look at that. So we can, yeah, we can make plots to, to answer that. Okay, so um, that's what this, um, you know, what these eigenvectors are. All right, now, this, I don't know if I want to sh show this necessarily, but when you do the singular value decomposition, the, the, those, those vectors are in, in the last matrix. So there's different ways of getting these in R. You, there's something called PC comp. There's SVD. So you, it's in our in our in our home in our um, labs you can actually do it. They are, you can see what the how do you actually get these v's. You don't actually have to write this algorithm. Someone has written it for you uh, several decades ago, and you know you, you at this point it's super fast. You know a huge array a, a gene expression array takes a couple of seconds to get these v's these vectors. And we're going to get to answer your question in a second. It'll become a little clearer. 
So just to, cla just to, just to add a little mathematical thing, this only, wor this only works if we can assume that the sum of the, if you just take every, when I said, you, when, when I said that the sum has to add up to one, it's not really the sum, you have to square them, and then they have to add up to one. So you, these vectors, if you square each one, that has to add up to one, and if you multiply one, one of the vectors by the others, they have to add up to zero. That's that when mathematicians talk about this, they call this orthogonal. So you, we have these conditions, and the main reason for having these conditions is to make kind of the math work out nice and clean. It's, it's one of the, otherwise, if you don't have this constraint, there's no, you, there's no other unique solution. It doesn't work. So now, um, yeah, we don't have to go over this. Oh, maybe we do. So yeah, so something that's, it, that's good, when you run SVD, the, um, ah, yeah, this is too, too, too much matrix algebra for Saturday. But, but the D, if you, can, you can go and look at this more carefully later, but if you compute the variance, right, between the variance of, of these transformations, so if you multiply the transform data by itself and then add it up, that's what this is, that's gonna, the, the, the variance of those, the, the, the result of, of multiplying these two things out are in the D matrix of the SVD, which means that this D, when you, when you do the singular validity composition and you get these three matrices, the D has the variability explained by each principal component. So when you, when you run SVD on, on R, you get, you get three matrices. One, the, the matrix that transforms the data, the matrix that tells you how much variability there is in each one, and the matrix that tells you what the transformed data vectors are. So I, I won't go over this because really, we wouldn't be able to, go, to get through it um, now, but, it, but the notes are there if you want to study them carefully and really understand what each one of these things are. But we, we, we are going to do it with data so that you can see how we use it. Go ahead. Yeah, so the SVD. So this, so the singular value decomposition is a, um, it's a result, it's a mathematical result that lets you, lets you rewrite a matrix. You know, a matrix, like a data matrix, like the ones we have into the multiplication of three matrices. The, um, the V, the last one, that's the matrix that we talked about, how we, how, how we get that, split, that splits up the data in the right way to get a lot, the most variability. So if you multiply Y by V, if you, if you trans, if you, um, yeah, if, if you take, if you, if you apply that transformation to the Y as we did before, where we take, let's say you have June and, and October, then you would take each, you would transform the data so that you would get for each um, gene, you would get, I'm sorry, for each sample, you would get something like the average in June. Now you have a new vector, so every that, that would be the transformation that the V would give you. The first principal component would say, now you have, for each sample, you have the average that you get in June. So that's, that then gives you then that transformation. The numbers you get are in U, and the D matrix explains, tells you how much variability that particular transformation explains. It's a, little, it's, it's, it's a little bit complicated to get just by hearing 10 minutes on it. You really do have to go in and study it uh, with more time. And, and with using the computer, when, we, when I show you some plots, I think it will become a little clearer. Okay, so I'm gonna go over one example that's not genomics, it's very simple. Maybe this will help understand the three matrices. And then we're gonna go into a gene expression example. Okay, so here is a plot of the height of identical twins. We're gonna do, we're gonna do the SVD transformation on this. Okay, so, <clears throat> so try to think of, um, 
a transformation, a, a how, you, how would you multiply these two numbers? So now you can think of, of each twin as being a gene, and then you have the two heights as the two samples. I see, there we have twins one versus twins two. So, and another, another way to, to, to think about this is, imagine you have to transmit the, this information, and you have, to set of, you have to transmit the information in this data uh, to someone in another country, and you're going to be charged per uh, byte. So you're going, to set, you're going to be sending, somebody on the other side of the world needs to know how tall each one of these twins is. And you have to send this information, but you're going to be charged by, by bit. So, and you have, you know, you're constrained in how much money you, you have, so how, what do you send? So you could, if you just think, the reason I use this example is, bec is because you could, if you just send the height of one of the two twins, you already have sent out most of the information. And, and what you get from the other one is not, is not really that informative. So you, you, could, you could almost tell them all they need to know by sending half the data. But there's actually some, something slightly better than sending just the height of one twin. Anybody know what it is? Think what it, you know what it is? Which is what, what you think? If it, in the end, it has a, is a simpler name in this case. It's the first principal component is going to be what? The mean. the mean of the two. It's not really the mean because it has to be divided by the square root of two. But yeah, but that's just a technicality. So yeah, so so when we, if you think, if you look at, if you think about what transformation makes each point, each twin as different as possible, right? We want to find some some. We want to find two numbers that. When you square them and add them, it adds up to one. And at the same time, if you multiply the data by those two numbers, so every twin, you would, you would, the number you would get would be height one times the first, A, let's call it A, height two times B. So what is A and B? And somebody over here has already said it's gonna be, the, it's gonna be one, you know, the average, so one, one half and one half. Because if I do that, think of, think of what happens when I do that. If I, if I take the average of each twin, you're going to get numbers with a very, very wrong, very, very, very big range. So now think of, here's another combination. How about the difference? So here, here are possibilities. So we have, we're going to do this thing that we showed before. Right, we showed that before. What, what V should we use? So one possibility is 1-1. One, one. That doesn't work, because it has to square out up to 1. So I have to divide by the square root of 2 to, make, to, to follow that constraint I was given. 1 squared, if you square it, you get 1 half plus 1 half. That's 1. That works. That's one possibility. So think of what happens to these things. Now we're going to get, for the tall, tall couples, we're going to get big numbers for the Short twins, we're going to get small numbers. A lot of variability. That's what we want. We want to make that variability, the, the variability across. Um, this is going to give us a new number, u, uh, j. We want a lot of variability across the uj's. But here's another one. Do you think this is a good choice? Let's think about that one for a second. So in, in the SVD, you were asking me about the SVD, these are the V's, these are the U's, and we're going to see what the D's are in a second. So is that a good choice? No, it's zero. It's almost zero. There's no variable. That's the difference in height. It's not zero, but it's small. No, 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 because remember, this is the, these are the V's. <laughs> right, so it's Y times 1, right, so, right, so the height, height 1, minus height 2. So that's the difference in the height of twins. So here's a picture of those two guys. This is the sum divided by the square root of 2. This is the difference. Big variability, small variability. So these are, these are, I'm plotting the u's. The v's are these transformations. This is the first PC and the second PC. So if I, if I sent this, 
If I tell my colleagues, I just tell them the first PC, they pretty much have, they have a lot, they have like four fifths of, or five sixths of the information. The second one is, so the, the, the second one has to, once you do the first one, you're, you kind of have nothing left to do because you're already, you're constrained to have something orthogonal, so the second one actually has to be the difference. That's a little bit more technical, but th you, ne you need something that multiplied by this gives you zero, and that's multiplied matrix multiplication. So you're kind of left with no choice but to have the difference at the second one. Once you, this is, let me say, this is not, this is, in, in genomics, we're going we're to have many, many PCs. Here we have two. Once you pick the first one, you, you, you're stuck. You have, you, you're stuck with the second one. It has to be something. It has to be a specific thing, which is this. Because this 1 times 1 plus t 1 times minus 1 is 0. That's the only choice you have so if you want them to multiply out to 0. Uh-huh. Well, th so this is, so okay, so when you transform, this is the transformation of the data that keeps the data. It's the same thing on both sides. Y equals, and then you have this multiplication. So you have to have the same on both sides. So what we're doing now is we're, we're, we're basically, show, I'm showing you the PCs, and it's, it's transformed the data. But the same information has to be there. So if you look at this closely, this is basically, all I'm doing is I'm rotating it. I'm taking the same data and I'm rotating it, right? Yeah. So it's the same data. Nothing's lost. It's the same information. But what, once you turn it into principal components, now you know that all the, all, most of the information is in this one. Yeah. You, can, you can get, you can, if you send both principal components, then you're sending the same information. You don't save anything. Actually, you still save a little bit because these numbers are smaller, so there's less bytes. But, um, but you, yeah, but this, by just sending this information, you, you already have most of it in the first PC. But the point is that the, this, tra this is the transformation, multiplying the first twin by one, multiplying the second by one, adding them up, that gives you the first principal component. And the difference is the second principal component. So in this case, we have V, is 1, 1, 1 minus 1, and then we need, them, we need them to add up to 1 when we square them, so that's why we need the square root 2. And then the D divided by the square root of M, which is the number of twins, is 4.3 for the first one, 1 for the second one. So this one explains that, that much more variability than this one. This, this all comes out of the I don't just running SPD on, on, in R. All right, so let's apply it to a microarray exa example. Okay, so now, now we're going to do it on real data. And you were asking me, how does this, how, how does this help? So I'm gonna, what I do here is I run SVD or, or, or get the principal components out of my matrix of Gene expression. This is the same example we've been looking at. So the first one, the first principal component, I'm just showing you here. So look, look at what I'm getting. I'm getting, I'm getting a trans, I'm a, the transformation that was selected by SVD gives me, for the first person, gives me a point negative three, point neg negative point three, second person, and then over here, it is, um, it, it, they, you, you start getting positive values. So I've, I've colored them on purpose, because I, I happen to know the, the, the month. I've colored them by month. But R didn't know about the month. I ran SVD, and it, on its own, it said the transformation that best, that, that explains the most variability here, is one that assigns Ne that ends up assigning negative values to, the, to June and positive values to October. D just num first, second, third, fourth, fifth sample. It just happened. This is, it, just did, it just worked out. That's because this happens to be that this, this 
wh whatever transformation gave us these numbers is the transformation that maximizes variability across people. When you take the variance of these, of these, thing, of these numbers, it gives us the biggest possible. And it happens to be, the, the, it happens to coincide with the month. It's not perfect, right? This guy, this guy seems to fall down here with the greens, but it's pretty strong. You had a question? No, so we, okay, so that's, that's a good question. Where's sex in here? We don't, we don't know. We're going to see, we're going to see sex in a second or maybe. We plugged in the ma we just plugged in the matrix of gene expression. Nothing else. We're not telling it anything else. Oh, oh, I see. So then it's, yeah, okay. We gave the expression that we were doing. And then you just colored it. I colored it because I happen to know. Yeah. But in a typical experiment, you don't know. Okay. I happen to know this, this is a month. Now here's, here's an, and now here's D. So the, the, the how much variability is explained by the first, second, third? There's a percent of variance explained by the first one. It's 21. Then the second one is 11. So you, you can see that this, I'm pretty sure this is a batch. How about the second one? Is that maybe a batch? Maybe. We don't know. So here's, this is where it gets tricky. How do we decide which ones to include, how many not to include? So now, finally, I'm going to answer your question. So here's, here's a plot I like to make to sort of get a sense for what's going on. So you get, these are 12 principal components. One, two, three, four, etc. And I'm, I'm splitting them by month. Remember, every person gets, when I get the vector of principal components, every person gets one number. And the second one, every person gets one number. On the third one, every person gets one number. So there's the first one. That's the, the picture I showed you with green and orange. Now, instead of plotting them, I'm just I'm making a box plot. The orange ones are here, the green ones are there. So it looks like the first principal component, it looks like it's pretty much month. The second one, eh, maybe. But that's about it. None of the other principal components correlate with month. You see that? It's just the first, it seems to be just maybe the first two. Well, oh, right. We, yeah. So left box plot are June. Right box plot is October. And the numbers come from SPD. Okay. And yeah, it's, I guess it's not very big, but it says the date. Um, yeah, it's, I can't even see it here. So you can now here. So here's now here's the here instead of instead of month. Now I'm using day, which we haven't even looked at yet. There's day. So now when we look at day, the first one is, is very strongly correlated with day. The second one too, the third one, maybe, I mean, maybe all the way down to here, we see some correlation. This is all very like visual. There's no, there's no rigorous statistical technique we're using here. But now, we're, now day was something we never considered as a batch, and it's showing up as, as something. So the point is, we, there, we suspect that the first few principal components are some kind of batch thing. We don't know what it is exactly. It seems to be related to month and day, and, but we don't know what it is. But we're now, instead of using month and instead of using day, we're actually just going to use the vectors that come out of principal component. That's gonna, those are going to be our covariates. Those numbers that, that I showed you earlier with green, and those are going to be the numbers I'm going to put in. I used to put in 1 for October and 0 for June. Now I'm going to put 1.2, 1.8, 1. the numbers that actually come out of the SPD. But this box plot tells me that it's, it's very similar. <laughs> putting in the month and putting in the first principal component as a covariate is very similar. 
But once I, once I start putting more of them, then now it's different. So, so here's, here's the, this is the singular validity composition written out as, um, as saying, I'm going to pick K. I'm going to pick K principal components. 5, 7, 12, I don't know, some K. They come out of the SVD. They just come out. They just tell me, how, how many do I include? And I'm going to say those are the factors. So this thing is my new model. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn that into a statistical model that that thing now turn this if you rewrite this thing with the V's the first part is going to be the the gene specific effects are here and then these V's are the new covariates so the first one is month pretty much the second one is something else the third one up to K that is my new model it came from the data it did not come from my investigating telling me about their lab technician and didn't, nothing of that. It came from the data. Yeah? But it's usually based on only uh, those points where the statistics are mixed words. No. Oh, we don't, we don't, no, we haven't gotten there yet. This is not the best way to do it. We have, we, we have not, we're going to show why this, there's a little slight problem with this. One of these V's could be sex. And in which case, we've thrown out the baby with the bathwater. We throw him out. That's why we have to be a little smarter than that. But very good observation. One of the, it's very possible that one of these Vs, and I could have made a plot. You can do it later. You can run SVD and see which of the principal components correlates with sex. And look, and here's, here's, the, here's a more specific answer to your question. So if I now fit this model, right? So what am I going to do? Oh, I got to go way back. Sorry, other people do this. Well, maybe I won't go all the way back. So what I, the model I'm going to fit is going to say y is equal to sex effect plus all these batches plus error. So I have a, now my matrix gets pretty big. If k is 5, you know, I, I, I can, I, I'll, I, I get that, right? So I, I, have, I have these k, I have these five new columns that I got from the data. And those are my new batch effects. If I fit that model, look at what happens. Look at all the sex stuff that goes away. Remember it was eight or nine? I got rid of four or five now. That's because I probably included a V that was this guy. And this looks kind of weird as well. I threw out too much. That's why this isn't easy. You can't just throw out PCs. If you do, you, you throw out too much. So now we're going to talk about smart, a slightly smarter thing to do. And we're, there's a lot of research going on right now. So this is the first paper that, that, that applied an approach like this. So it's the same idea. We're going we're gonna to try to estimate these Ws using PCA. But now we're going to be smart about this. We're going to try to be careful not to get rid of that. So how do we do that? Uh, so this is current research. So there's, SVA has an approach, which I'll explain. There's other things people are doing, but, but this is kind of where we are right now. So one, one approach that is becoming quite popular for people that have control genes is to use the control genes to, to do what we just did and estimate the Ws. And there you don't throw away this, the, the, the actual outcome you're interested in. There's a, there's a piece of software called RUV, Remove Unwanted Variability, that does that, but it requires controls. There's, um, and then there's, there's other versions of coming out that try, that they, they try different tricks to try to get pseudo control genes. To do it, and here's, and I'm, I'm going to very briefly explain how SVA does it. Um, so here's what they do. So SVA uses an iterative approach to estimating the batch of the V's, the batch effects, without taking out the um, 
the actual effects. So here, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm using the data from their uh, talks instead of the one I've been using. So this is, very, this is a simulated data. It's not real. But you can see uh, the batch effects. Here's batch 1. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. You see the batch? And then the real, the real fem male versus female part would be that versus that. I, I, I didn't have time to, to keep my same data set, so I borrowed the one that they use for their talks. So the, the true batch, see, this, this would be the true, the, the true V that we're trying to get to. It's just one in this case, but there could be more. See, so the first two are on that one, second two are here, then five in a row are over there. You see, you see the pattern? One, two up, one, two down, five up, one down, uh, four down, one up, down, two, two. See that? That's the batch. And then this is the ca cases and controls. So what do they do? They, the first thing they do is they, they um, estimate the batch effect using straight up PCA like we did. And now they get an estimate of the batch, and this is it. It's awful. But now, now they're going to they're gonna use that estimate, and they're going to fit the entire model with the covariance of interest and update it. So now, now what happens is they're going to try to get, they're going to try to figure out which genes appear to be most affected by batch and not by the, the, the real covariate. So, this is, so now each gene gets a weight, and you can see which genes are getting most of the weight. Do you see how it's, now it's working kind of okay? This is automatic. This is what their software does. So dark means they got a high weight. So these guys, these genes are getting weight. Those top ones aren't getting weight because it, it appears to have a strong real effect. So these guys are getting the weight. And now when it, when it estimates in the, in the, in the next, um, in the next uh, update, now it's getting a little bit better to the real thing. So the updates again. Keeps iterating now, and we get we keep getting closer and closer um, until we have the batch. Yeah. It, it yeah. That these are now now that's all like ad hoc stuff, right? They have some choices in their algorithms. I actually can't answer the question very specifically, but the algorithm just ha just makes these choices, which again is why these these things are not fail proof. The other thing, it also, it's also, this is, this is a simplification in that it only has one batch that I'm showing you. What happens when there's five? Right, so when, so there's this, this algorithm chooses that for you as well, and that's also very susceptible to, to um, you know, having problems. If you choose eight instead of four, or, yeah. go ahead. Um, so you're telling it which ones are treatment and control. Yes, you have to tell it which ones are treatment and control. Otherwise, yeah, then it's... But you, that, you, we usually do know that. But we're not telling it when it's October or June. We didn't say any of that. So now, in this particular data set, SVA worked really great. This, I, I'm not going to say this is always the case, but this case where, I, where, where we've been looking at, look at that. That's good, huh? It all, they almost all of these went away, and these eight stayed. So in this case, it did work very well. And this was completely automatic. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like fudge. Any, I didn't try. I didn't like tell it, tell it to choose five or six. It just worked. But you can, you'll see when you try it out yourself, there will be cases when you make this plot, it doesn't look this good. And you know, this, this is why it's always good to to be looking at, looking at um, diagnostic plots all the time. So yeah, so so the in silico, so it's being it's being used in two ways. One one of them is to have real signals, and then there's um, and then there's there's an argument to be made that you could put enough genes that are not changing 
to, to, to be here. To, to, have, to have this plot also come from spikings. But those, those methods only work when the spikings are susceptible to the same batch effects. Otherwise, it won't catch it, right? So if your spikings are, are, are not, if whatever made the batch exist had, say, say cell heterogeneity, your spikings aren't going to catch that. Yeah? So th this, is not, this is not use controls. SVA does not use controls. It tries to find them on, from data. But, but, it, but if you are, but it, I would, my own bias is that anything, if you have good controls, it's going to work better than any of these automatic things. And something like a thousand works well, w would work well. That's a lot, right? But I'm saying that uh, you, you might be get away with less, but that I've seen, I've seen examples where, where like a thousand works really, really great. Well, well, the idea would be to, to spike it in automatically every time. So if, if all the, the array, the array if in microarrays, I don't know, I'm sequencing, if you could do, you eventually we'll come up with something similar, but microarrays, we could have all the companies get together and say, every microarray will have these thousand genes on it, genes, and here's a kit that you will put in to everything you do. I think they do. There's like this ERCC thing, that the external RNA control consortium that's, that, that has a proposal on what to use. OK. So that's how SVA works. And some of these other, some of these other methods that use control is gonna, are going to be similar. Any other questions? Yeah. Is it possible to have a selection So is it, what do you mean to find? If it has to be there first, are you asking is it, is it always there or is it possible to find? When it's there and you can't find it, <laughs> that doesn't have batch effects. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess you could. I, ha I haven't really seen. I haven't seen a very b a big data set that doesn't have some kind of batch effect yet. But yeah, I guess it's, it, it should be possible in principle. Like that is so. What? Wait. Okay. So I'm I'm not sure I understand your question. Are you saying how can I distinguish real interesting biology biology from batch effects, or or are you asking me um, how do I know that when I see some that when I what? That's the hard. I would say that's the hardest part of of this of this type of analysis is, is, is figuring out when you are, we, ha we have overdone it. That's difficult. That, that's how, without positive controls, it's hard to be sure. So the, the, what has happened, the approach that people have kind of accepted as a better practice up to now is to be cautious because we know that batch effects can confuse you into having false positives. So we, we, have been, we have erred, at least data analysts have erred on the side of having false negatives. But you know, that's a decision that you can make. You can say, I, I'm willing to risk it. Maybe if you're gonna, if you're gonna validate, right, you might be more inclined to not correct and just see what you get. So, you know that that's not a question. That's not a question that's easy to answer. But in general, we have erred on the side of controlling false positives, mainly because we've seen we've seen cases where you get so many of them. 
like this one we just did, right? That, that was a real data set that got published in Nature Genetics. Bef they didn't do anything. They published a paper saying 70% of genes change between ethnicities. We, I don't want to be the, the, the data analyst that says that. I'd rather be the one that says, no, we can't tell anything from this. So yeah, but that is, that is you know, that's a, it's a, it's a balance that you have, you have to make you know, decisions based on it. But, I, but the one thing that is for sure true is that you, or for sure it's positive, is to know of this possibility. And then if you, and you, this way you can take calculated risks. You say, I, I, you know, here's a, here's, here's a list of differentially expressed genes, but, I, but there was a batch effect and I didn't correct for it. So take, them with, you know, take that into account before you spend a bunch of money on, on validation. Any other questions? All right, so we were going to talk, we wanted to introduce some of the DNA methylation stuff, so I can do that after a break or, or just go right into it. Huh? Go for another half hour? All right, I'll, I'll try, I'll, I'll keep it short and simple. And maybe I'll tell you that everything's fine with this and you don't have to worry about anything. All right, so I, I, have you guys already seen the tau bisulfite sequencing work? Yeah, okay. All right, somebody explain that? Okay, so I won't go over that. Where's my mouse? Oh, it's over there. Come back. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll go right into data then. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over measuring DNA method. I'm not going to go over the biology and I'm not going to go over the technology, just go straight into the data. So there's two, right now it's the most common types of data I get from methylation are from microarrays and, and from um, bisulfite sequencing, both bisulfite sequencing, <coughs> one from the four, what's called, a four, people just call the 450K array from Illumina and then sequencing. And, and by the way, I should, before I keep going, this, what we present, I just want to just reiterate, the batch effect presentation, we use the microarray exper experiment as an example only because they're so easily available, but we see them in sequencing too. So you, wanna, you don't, don't think that just because it's, don't think it's a specific problem to microarrays or a specific problem to gene expression, because we see it in, in everything. Okay, so we see it here too. All right, so our, um, in arrays, how does it work? You get, it's like, the, it's like the, chips, the chip, the SNP chips. I don't know if you guys have seen the SNP chips where you have one probe for one allele and one probe for the other. So for DNA methylation, they take advantage of this technology and they, they basically use it in the same way. You have one probe that will hybridize to the methylated, uh, unmethylated CPG pr of probe and one that will hybridize to the methylated one. So you have one probe that's going to be high when there's methylation and another probe that's going to be high when there's no methylation. So it's very similar to the SNP chip. You have these two numbers and you can form a, like a, a ratio of these two so that w one means you're methylated and zero means you're not. Okay, so yeah, you get two numbers, and it's, it's, not like, it's not like genotypes where you make a plot of these two numbers and you see the three uh, genotypes in methylation, you see numbers all over the place between zero and one. Um, for sequencing, it's, it's, it starts similarly, but then instead of probe hybridization, we count um, reads that fall on the CPG, we find all that we have these tricks for mapping, taking into account the conversion. So you have a specific CG. Does that mean right first here? Yeah. So for arrays, you get a U and an M. 
pro uh, hybridization from that, and you get numbers like, let's throw this one away. <laughs> Armin, catch. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so you have U, ooh, it's nice and wet. Okay, U and M, and you get numbers like 16,500, and over here you get like uh, uh, 7,000. Right, so that, that's the kind of data you get, and usually people, and usually one way to, to, to summarize that is to take u divided by u plus m. Sometimes they add a little constant to avoid zeros. And you know, if you got a zero here, then it, you get an infinity. So this is a number between zero and one. When m is really big compared to u, it's a one. Otherwise, it's a zero. And that's your measurement of methylation. So there's a lot of work. Being, there's, there's some statisticians working on improving these U's and M's. Um, but most of the time, most analyses, you just get these numbers. So every CPG, you get one of these between 0 and 1. And if you make a typical sample, when you look at across the whole chip, you make a picture, it looks kind of like this. So it's not like, the, it's not like the, the, the SNP chips where you have three clear modes, this thing We'll have like the unmethylated, the really highly methylated, and there's like the partially methylated, and then some stuff in between. But you get the whole range of numbers. Unlike in SNP chips, you get something more like this. You know, a bunch here. But on methylation arrays, you get something like that. Okay, so on, in, array, in, in sequencing, it's a little bit different. You map all the reads. To, to, to a location you're trying to read, and you focus on the C, right, so you get that, and then you get some, you get a U and an M again, but now it's gonna be more like, if your coverage is, tw is 10, you know, what is this one? This is two and eight. And again, you can do the same thing, U, and you, if you stick to places where there's coverage, this will never be zero. Right? There's coverage, one of them has to be one, at least. But it's the same idea. These, num these are actual counts of alleles you see, this is something else, this is hybridization. But in essence, they're very similar. Okay, so uh, this we, mod we can model, we can get away with modeling nor with normal assumptions, although you know, sometimes you're close to one, so it's not quite gonna be a normal distribution. In this one, it's kinda hard to, to do normal assumptions, because the numbers are so small, so we usually do things like binomial or something else. Okay, so now what I wanna focus on is the analysis. So you get a data set and you're asked to find, for example, differentially methylated regions between two ca cases and controls. And, and, and again, to, to make it very clear why we get numbers that, aren't, that are not 0, 1, this, this is, you guys, know better, you guys know this better than me, but this is, this is not one cell, this is a whole population of cells. So even though each specific cell is 0 or 1, when you take the population, you get numbers that are in a continuum. And in fact, I, I bet you in one cell you can get jumps. You know, I bet you one, one CPD site probably os can oscillate between being methylated and not, right? That's, it's not a very strong, anyway, that's another discussion. Okay, so, but the point is you get, no, you get a continuum, so we can do things like t-tests. If you have one location, you can, you can, you'll have uh, normals and cancers. For the normals, you'll get, you, you can get numbers like 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6. For the, for the normals, you get 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 4, and you can do a t-test. Right? You treat them roughly as normal and get, then, then it's the same as, as, as it is for gene expression or, 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 or sequencing. So here's a, here's a plot of what um, the data can look like. You get a data set. Here is cancer normal. You get several CPG. This is just one location. You, you get thousands and thousands. For the arrays, you get 450,000 CPGs. For sequencing, you can either get the whole shebang 
all 20 million of them, or with reduced representation, you get subsets of locations. But you can, you can almost always still make pictures like this. So this is the first advi advice I'm going to give you, is make pictures that show you pieces of the genome. Don't focus on one CPG at a time, because you're going to learn a lot more when you make pictures like this. So here's a, here's a nice picture showing you the data for a chunk of chromosome 19 that I just picked kind of at random. And you have CPG1. I have 16 points, because there's six norm, eight normals and eight cancers. And then the same for the sec, this CPG, and this, and this, and this. And this. So you have several CPGs and eight. Um, eight and eight for each. And then I'm adding these curves. That's the low S curve. Have you guys, did you guys do low S? Smoothing? A little bit. A little bit. So it's a smooth curve going through the data uh, as a population average. Okay, so now, um, some of the analysis that we do take into account the fact that there, there, there probably is some importance in things that behave that in, in, in um, ch long, longish chunks of the genome. So as opposed to, if I'm giving a, a, a data set, I'm asked to find differentially methylated CPGs or whatever, I will try to look for regions that are differentially methylated, not just a single CPG. So I'm going to show you some examples of what that how, how those two analyses can give different results. So the, gen the general idea, the way we apply it statistically, now I'm, I'm going back to this linear model that I've been showing. It's very similar. You, you recognize it now. You have the beta 0 for the mean level. Then you have the beta 1 for the difference and the x. So in the case of cancer, you would have zero cancer normal. Some The normals would have a 0 and the cancers would have a 1. And then beta 1 sh is the population difference between normal cancer. But what's new now, the way this is different, the way I analyze this differently than from gene expression, is now you see this, instead of having an a index here telling me the gene ID, right? Before we had a, an I in front of the 0 and an I in front of the 1, because each gene got its own beta. Now I'm thinking of it as a function of the genome. That's why it's a parentheses, and there's a location and a J. It's a, it's a function, and it's a function of location. So before, two, if two genes were next to each other and you were doing t-tests, you didn't care that they're next to each other. You did not take that into account. You just analyze each gene on its own. Now we can, ex we can get some power by taking into account the fact that things that are next to each other should, this is now methylation, so it, sh it probably has some, some qualities in common. So let me show you one example of what I mean by that. So if, if I do a, let's see, one CPG at a time, and I do a t-test, this is one of the highest ones I get. You see, you see why, right? What would be the p-value of that? 10 to the minus, I don't know, 17 or something? Who can do this on their head? Uh, and then here's another one. That's probably more like 0.001. <laughs> but you know, you get, you get what I'm saying, right? This is, this is very significant. Yeah, this is, this is one in a millions or something. Okay, so now that's a single, that's, that does not take into account the, fu the functional aspect of it. Okay, now, so in, in the model that we just showed, this is the beta. This difference is the beta, or the estimated beta. And this is the beta for L2. It's L1 and L2. OK, now let me show you. This is what I, I encourage you to do. Don't stop here. Go take it further. Take it into account the fact that these are functions. And look at the whole region. So I'm going to show you this guy in its region. And here it is. You see it there? See all the blues up there? But look at the surroundings. So what I'm, what I'm showing you down here, I haven't said this yet, is I'm, I'm estimating the beta at each location, 
the difference, and I'm low Sing it, smoothing it. If I do that here, you have, if I smooth it, there's no difference if I smooth. If I assume beta is a, func is a smooth function of location, and I estimate beta that way, that point does not come out as different. Here's the second one. Now I'm going to show you that one. There, it's one of these. It's one of these. I can't remember which one. But. Well, this one is a, that's a whole, that's a completely different picture now. No, no, you have a whole series of points that look different. And now when I smooth it, I, I do get a, a bump that's different from zero. So we, that one of the things that we've done is we've actually written an algorithm to specifically search for these bumps instead of every point. We call it bump hunters, bump hunting. Mm -hmm. Bump hunter is the name of the, of the package. Which maybe we should use that little dog that showed up at the f as a symbol for <laughs> bump hunter. So uh, that's so what we're we're searching for regions of the genome that show this kind of behavior. Specifically, that. So here's the I'm gonna just just give you the the, the very short summary of, of of the idea and then we'll stop. So uh, the idea is to go back going back here. We want to estimate this guy as a smooth function of L. So not just like choppy little things, but as a smooth function of L. And then look for places where that beta, where the estimated smooth function is above a threshold for a whole, you know, a, a, an entire section of it as above a threshold. And we're gonna, we're gonna give more weight to bumps that are longer. So let me just show you what I mean. So here is a, an example from a paper we, we've published. The data is from a paper. And I purposely picked an outcome that's not 0, 1. So you can see that the, one of the nice things of using these linear models. In this linear model now, beta is the slope of a line. It's not the difference between 1s and 0. Although technically, the difference between 1s and 0 is the slope of a line, too. But here is more explicitly the slope of a line. So now instead of cases and controls, I have gestational age. This is blood from, from newly borns. So there's a gestational age of the individual. And on the y-axis is the methylation. So you can see that every point, now I have every point is one individual. It has an age and a methylation value. And I fit a, I fit a, uh, line. And the slope of that line is my beta estimate. So that is how many betas am I estimating in A? How many? One. And I have 450,000 of them. So every CPG gets one beta. And here they are. Here are some of them. Right, so there's one beta, second two, do this. You see, every point is a beta hat, and this is the L. And this beta is that beta. See how it's pointing and saying 1A? That point comes from that plot. But every single point here comes from a picture like that. So now, next step, smooth it. That's the blue line. You use low S, smooth it. And now we're gonna. Now we want to do. We want to get a. A. a we want to quantify that object that we've just found. We want to quantify it and take it a step further. Ask ourselves: Could we have seen such a bump by chance? So now we're going into new territory in statistics, right? We know how to compute the p-value of a number, of observed mean. But now it's not a number; it's a bump. It's the p-value of a shape. So it's hard. That's not something we have solved. And there's a lot of research going on in that field. But what we do, just for now, one of the things we do, there's many things, there's many things we're trying. But one simple thing you can do is you summarize the bump somehow 
for example, with the area. That's now one number. That's one way you can do it. So now every little bump gets its area. And there's another little technicality that is very convenient to do in practice. We define a buffer. So to, for something to be a, considered a candidate bump, it has to go past that buffer. Otherwise, you get tens of thousands of bumps, because any, every little thing that isn't zero is going to be a bump. So by defining a buffer, you, 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 you reduce it down to, to 100. Well, it depends how. You can control how many candidates you get by either increasing or decreasing this buffer. All right, the, the bigger you make it, less things get by. But you don't want to make it too big, because then you, can, you might miss things. So you have, this is a bump. It, go, it got past the buffer. This is its area. It looks nice. It looks like a real hit. Now let's see, is it significant or not? How can we do that? All right, so now that gets, that gets a little bit complicated. But one simple thing that you can do, at least simple in terms of understanding it, is to permute the data. Redo it again and see how often you get bumps with this area. So what am I saying? You're taking, you're taking those values up there. You permute them, and you get slopes again. You, you repeat the whole thing again. So you do a 1,000 times. Permute the data. Smooth, get slopes. Smooth. Get the area. Save those areas. Yeah? So you take, so I'm, take, I'm saying just, if just the, under the null hypothesis that gestational age and methylation don't correlate. Okay. If I permute the gestational ages, mm -hmm. just randomly shuffle them, mm -hmm. then I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get bumps by chance, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna get areas by chance, but they are, they are not interesting. So this is a histogram of the areas I get when I permute the data. And that, and this guy is there. It's totally possible to get a bump like that by chance. So you were all getting excited. It's not even real. Yeah. Right, so this is, this is the area, right? So let's see. Um, this is... Oh, actually, that's the, areas is the number of probes. So this is, this is about eight probes times this height, right? And that, that gives you a point 0.16. So if this was about eight times taller or eight times wider or four times taller and, and two times wider, it would be out here. So, th so that's... So that's um, you know, you, you can get more extreme by either going, going bigger or getting uh, taller. But, that, that's so, but there are, we, did, we, do, we did get some real ones here. I just wanted to show you a, a, a non-real one. So that's, that's currently the type of analysis we do for um, defining differentially methylated regions. We call them regions as opposed to CPGs. You want to have a question? No? Okay. So because you put each region, there would be multiple CPGs. Yeah, you can see them here, right? Yeah. There's, there's about 8 to 10 in this one. Mm -hmm. So in cancer, we see, in, when we compare tissues, we see a ton, ton of regions, thousands and thousands. And when we do cancer, we see a lot too. And one of the more recent things we found is that in cancer specifically, we have these long, long regions that are hypomethylated. So we have to change the analysis a little bit to, to find things that long. long yeah, like they, they're megabases long. So, oh yeah, something I, for the array, actually for both of them, this is now a technicality if you're going to actually try it out. That is an important one. You have, if you're going to smooth, you want things to be relatively close by and the scale to the, di the distance between points to be roughly at the same scale. Right? You don't want to be smoothing five points that are here with five points that are a million base pairs away. So one of the things we do is we split up the... We, when we're doing the analysis, the first thing we do is we split up the, the points 
into groups of things that are close by, and we define close. So in, in the case of the array, of the 450K array, we've done 500, 750 base pairs, which we, you know, the different peoples in the group have different preferences, but around, you know, in the order of 500 to 1,000 base pairs. Anything that's, as soon as a point is more than 1,000 base pairs away, it gets put into another group, and that gets analyzed separately. So you can see, so here, this, this is one of those groups. The next group might be over there somewhere, and it gets analyzed separately. In the meet, there's no points to, uh, to so what we're, what we're doing is we're not, we're not assuming that that point tells us anything about that point over there. Now for the, for the mega base resolution analysis, then we, had, we did have to kind of step back and look at another resolution, and basically that there was you know, some decisions to be made, but one was to, to collapse things into groups and then analyze them at a, at a, at a, at a higher resolution. So that, that's, I'm starting to see that more and more. That seems to, is, I think that's going to become an active area of research, not just in DNA methylation, but in, in other functional genomic outputs, is multi-resolution analysis, where you, you have things happening at the, like, like at the TSS level, and then you have things happening kind of at the chromatin or you know, 3D structure level that are going to be much longer. And maybe there's more than two resolutions, right? Maybe there's, there's the SNP resolution, there's the, there's the, TS, the, there's the, uh, the um, TSS resolution, and then there's the maybe multiple resolutions of, of 3D structure stuff. So yeah, so that, that is some, that our pack. We have this package that kind of does that automatically for you. You can you can say I want to divide it up into groups like that. For sequencing, you also get that even for whole genome bisulfide sequencing, you still have these gaps that you wanna you wanna chunk things into pieces because there's long gaps where you, you there's either unmappable regions or you didn't get any coverage, and then we we sep we split them up that way. Yeah. So low S is a sliding window approach, kind of. So that's a sliding window. That blue curve comes from a sliding window approach. But what I'm saying is that the next set of points gets analyzed with a separate sliding window approach. It does. They don't because they, you could apply the sliding window to the two of them together. You know, but then you have this emptiness in the middle that doesn't do anything. The, what do you mean the baseline? So you have your area in C. The red oh, the red lines? No, the dotted blue. Is this the local minimum? Or? Wait, the what? Sorry, the... The, the position on the y axis that you're determining the, the, the baseline for your area. Zero? But that's zero. Yeah, because this is an effect. We're estimating the effect. <laughs> We're estimating the, the effect of gestational age on methylation or vice versa. So zero means there's no effect. So anything deviating from zero is interesting. So the, then further back, the red, how do you that, The red is also very ad hoc. So the, okay. yeah, so we, my, you know, I, when I do this in practice, I sometimes pick point one because just from seeing a lot of data, that, that seems to give you sensible results. If you, if, you, if you make it smaller than 0.1, then you start getting kind of tiny little blocks, regions that have tiny effect sizes. Mm -hmm. that c I don't know why they, they come up, but they do. And, and you know, it's hard to believe that that has any, that has any interest. There's something that's, that has that, that small of an effect size. But another thing we do is from, a more automatic thing you can do is from the simulations, from the permutations, you can say, I, wanna, I want this red line to be at the 99th percentile of, 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 the, of, a, of, a, of, of the observed distance under the null. You see? So, you, you have, so from there, you're going to get a, a distribution of, of differences, and you can say, I want the 99th percentile. From, from, not just from that one, but from all of them combined. Chunk 
Yeah, you mean like a real? So at the end, what? Well, so at the end, you we 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 give you back a table. That oh, the whole thing is high, but it doesn't get past the threshold. Yeah. Yeah, that wouldn't come up. Then you know that's that's a limitation, right? So that, that's you could always just make the threshold as small as possible to find that. But now we're talking like, you're saying like there's like this tiny little effect that's just very, very long. Oh, then it'll get caught. Like, so if you have, if this line was the, if the whole line was high, it, it, it passes the threshold. Oh, I guess I, I wasn't clear on that. The threshold is a selection made for the entire <laughs> genome. So that threshold stays the same. So if, if you have a region where the whole thing is, is out here, that's, that's above the threshold, it has a huge area, and that, that one will be significant. So in fact, that's how we discovered the blocks, the, these hypomethylated blocks, the first time we saw them in cancer, is because we saw region after region, when we were, when we were doing our, our, our high resolution analysis, we saw that region after region, there were like, there were there were like these long, like you just described, that the whole thing was different. And then when we, when we took a step back and, and looked at it at a high, at a, what is that, lower, higher resolution, we saw that the whole thing, it, it was just not just these little chunks, it was the whole thing was different, was hypomethylate. Yeah, and, I'm, I'm, and you're seeing that in other marks too. People are starting to see that. That, you know, that these, these, these hidden Markov models that, that decide on a specific resolution, you see like there's these areas that have all these things called on one state and they're kind of all in a row, maybe one missing here and there. It's very clear that there's something higher level going on that maybe should be analyzed differently. Because whatever's happening biologically, it's, it's like a whole thing. It's, 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 it's the whole section that's, being, that's behaving differently. Not, not, it's not a bunch of sections smaller behaving differently together, it's actually the whole thing changing. The 3D structure changed completely, for example. Yeah? If you could change uh, the lowest parameter to change the scale, you look at it, right? The lowest. Yes, right. So that's what you, you, you can do. But the problem with that, yes, so that would be, we, uh, we have to do that. When we go to the higher resolution, the lowest smoother now is huge. Right, good point. Right, so because now we don't, we don't, we don't want this. Le this, these would be considered wiggles now when we look at a, bi a million base pairs. So, so yeah. So two things happen. One is that there's the, the groups, the clusters of points get get collapsed into one. So now, now th like this, this whole region could be just turned into one point, and now we have that region here and this one here. And this one. So now it changes completely, and now the, the lowest we do has this big of a span, which in this figure you can't even see it, right? It's the size of the wall or something, or, or higher. Yeah, every, it's, uh, the whole thing changes. It's like a whole different analysis at a whole different resolution. Yes. It's lower yeah. in those in those longish things. Yeah, it does break down a little bit. Yeah, we we're stu we haven't really looked at that deeply, but we have observed that the the correlation is higher in in islands and shores and than in these longer regions. Mm -hmm. And by the way, now that you mentioned correlation, one of the questions that you, you should you, one as a statistician when you see a, a curve like that you 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 believe it has to be real it looks you can never get that by chance right how could you possibly get something so smooth by chance like that and and the reason is because the measurement error for each for the adjacent points is correlated so when you have very when you have noise that's correlated you do get curvy curvy behavior like that so that's, what, that's how you get that curve, just due to noise. It's, it's, it's the, there, was a mis, there was an error that made, it, that made all of them go down together. It had nothing to do with gestational age. What you said is that the longer the sentence conversion, 
Ajax, for example. For example, right? Yeah? But why don't you destroy that by doing the permutation? Because the permutation doesn't permute uh, uh, location, it only permutes individuals. Right, so imagine that, imagine that there's a whole chunk that always moves together. So there's an error occurred, and it, it, let's say it only affects five out of the 50, but those five happen to be cases. So then you'll get a little blip that will be a few CPGs, not just one. See, it's tricky, but yeah, it could happen. Imagine your data is like this. So everybody has an error. This is, the X's are the CPGs. Right, so everybody has an error there. Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. But when you, and, when you average, and when you average this, if you take a random permutation, then that, that guy is going to be sometimes like that, sometimes like this. But it's an, but it's a mist it's an error. It's measurement error, but it's correlated. Yeah, that, that makes this tough, because because you get smooth things because the biology is smooth, but the measurement error is also smooth. So it's hard. It's hard to distinguish them. More questions? <laughs>